All right, it's 12 o'clock, so I think we'll get started. Um, we want to keep everything running on schedule here today. So thank you very much for joining us um, for our webinar, Herbicide Management Tips for Integ Integrating Cover Crops into the Rotation. Just a couple of Zoom housekeeping tips before we get started. Um, all participants have their audio and video turned off during the webinar. If you are from Nova Scotia and are looking to get pesticide points for this session, please make sure that the name displayed on your Zoom screen matches your the name on your pesticide license. Um, we need that just to match it up and verify um, who attended the session. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. There's also a chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, keep an eye on that as there may be some links um, posted there, including the pesticide point survey um, and any other relevant information throughout the session. And uh, questions we will be addressed at the end of the presentation. So we do have uh, certified crop advisor CEUs and Nova Scotia pesticide points available for this session. Um, in order to get credit for the session, you, each participant needs to watch on their own device and um, have the, as I said before, have make sure that the name on Zoom matches the name on your license. Um, there will be a link posted in the chat to go to a survey um, to fill out your name and, oh, excuse me, <coughs> your name and pesticide number. And you have to print that screen and submit that when you apply to renew your certification. If you have any trouble with the pesticide point survey, please email me and I will help you out. So with that, um, we'll dive into things. I'm really pleased to welcome our speaker today. John Wallace is an assistant professor of weed science at Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences. His expertise includes <clears throat> weed ecology, herbicide-based and organic weed management, and sustainable cropping systems. So yeah, I'm excited to dive in. And John, I'll let you take that away. Sure. <clears throat> well, thanks, Caitlin. Um, appreciate the invite and very happy to uh, chat with you folks today. Um, just a, a little bit of background. Um, I'm, I'm an extension weed specialist in field and forage crops here in Pennsylvania. and um, of course, we are a, a dairy state, and that really kind of uh, colors our, our cropping systems. Um, we're also a state that uh, has a, a fair amount of um, no-till adoption. So uh, it's estimated that about two-thirds of our annual croplands uh, use no-till practices. Uh, and we're a state that has seen a, a fair amount of cover crop adoption. And so a lot of my work focuses on how do we balance weed management uh, in these systems, um, in these conservation tillage uh, systems. Um, so I'm going to um, try to cover a couple different cropping system scenarios and kind of walk through some considerations for um, weed control and herbicide programs uh, that help facilitate the integration of, of uh, cover crops in different phases of the rotation. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience with interseeding in corn and how to think about designing a herbicide uh, program for that. I understand that there's some interest or maybe some adoption of that practice. Um, however, a lot of what we've learned about, you know, the potential for carryover injury uh, of, of herbicides to cover crops um, would also, um, you know, it would, it would also transfer to thinking about post-harvest seeding as well. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some considerations for maybe some longer growing season windows for integrating cover crops in the rotation. And so that might be after a small grain phase or if um, some vegetable crop rotations have a nice long fall window for integrating cover crops. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about some considerations for uh, terminating cover crops, those winter hardy cover crops uh, in the spring. Uh, a couple um, kind of bookkeeping things. Um, I've interacted enough um, with my colleagues north of the border, uh, like Peter Sycama, to know that um, you guys uh, were using the same active ingredients, but with different product names in some, in some cases. And so I'm going to use mostly active ingredients, and hopefully that's enough information for you all because I'm, 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 I'm not familiar with all the trade names. 
Uh, and, and just and, to jump in there for a second, I think uh, Rosie's going to post some trade names and the equivalents in, in Canada in the perfect. chat. Thank you. Yes. And and my colleagues north of the border are also much more equipped and better at uh, making um, making the conversion from uh, English to metric. And so uh, I'm mostly I'm not going to talk too much about rates, uh, but um, it, most of what I'm going to talk about will be thinking about using standard product rates. And so that would apply equally across labels. OK, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, and I've, I've really tried to design this talk to allow uh, for a good amount of time at the end for some discussion because I'd, I'd really enjoy hear, hearing about, um, uh, you know, hearing questions or um, your thoughts on, on these subjects. Okay, let me get, make sure I have a laser pointer here. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start by talking about interceding cover crops and, and carryover herbicide risks. And so uh, we've been working on interseeding here in Pennsylvania for a number of years, and um, both from kind of agronomic perspective, but also a weed management perspective. And what I'm going to talk about today is really um, drill interseeding at early corn growth stages. And so you can see a, a picture of that here on the right, where we're coming in with a high clearance grain drill at about the V4 uh, corn growth stage and drill interseeding cover crops between corn rows. Um, and so what, what is kind of the cropping system fit? Um, well, here in the Northeast region, uh, we're really investigating this practice um, as a way to get cover crops into the rotation where we have limited fall growing season windows. And that's uh, in, in our area, our, our grain production acres, um, either corn grain uh, or soybeans, but we've been focusing on uh, a corn phase. That, I understand um, corn silage harvest in in your area is perhaps maybe a month later than uh, than um, we would take corn silage off, and so uh, perhaps it's it's a good fit for corn silage acres uh, in your region as well. Whereas our corn silage acres uh, probably have a long enough growing season window where post harvest seeding would make more sense compared to to interseeding the cover crop. Uh, we also think that there's a little bit of a latitudinal gradient effect going on, although um, it's really variability, you know, there's a lot of variability as far as what affects performance of interseeding cover crops, but uh, certainly in our areas um, where we have milder growing seasons during the summer, uh, lower corn yield potentials, um, we typically see better performance when interseeding relative to kind of high uh, uh, yield potential areas where we're um, harvesting north of 200 or 225 bushels per acre. Um, and the fit is really, you know, um, just achieving the same kind of conservation goals that we would expect or want from post-harvest seeding practices. And in our region, we think a lot about certainly protecting the soil and then uh, nutrient scavenging, nitrogen scavenging uh, from our fall sown cover crops. Um, and so, a lot of the early work that was done um, in Pennsylvania uh, focused on kind of uh, interceding timing and the right um, species to use for this practice. And so what we've kind of arrived at as far as the optimal timing is somewhere between the V3 and V5 corn growth stage. So some of that work showed that you can intercede too early and, and see a yield drag. Um, you start to plateau as far as your kind of cover cropping performance um, when you're interceding later. Um, and so uh, most of the work that I'm going to talk about is trying to intercede at about that V4 uh, growth stage. So we're maybe 35 days, perhaps 42 days after corn planting, we would be coming in to intercede uh, that cover crop. And um, there was a fair amount of work done that focused on finding what those shade tolerant uh, species were that were a good fit for, for interceding into corn. Um, and so the ones that we uh, see being used the most in our region would be annual ryegrass is really the workhorse when it comes to grass cover crops. Um, so it's winter hardy in our region. I, I, I'm, I, I'm assuming it's also winter hardy uh, in your area as well. Um, 
uh, Sierra rye has been less um, consistent as an interseeding species, but there's interest in, in interest in using cereal rye because it's a nice rotation of fit if you're uh, going to transition to a soybean phase. Uh, but it's, it doesn't seem to have you know, the same amount of shade tolerance relative to annual ryegrass. Um, the smaller seeded uh, legumes, medium red clover and crimson clover have been kind of the best performing legume cover crops. Um, we've tried other legume species and, and, and there's some growers that are trying other larger seeded legumes like Austrian winter pea or, or maybe some summer annual uh, legumes like cow pea or sun hemp. Uh, and then uh, we have pretty good success interseeding uh, a couple brassica species and really daikon radish or forage radish is the most consistent brassica species that we use um, when interseeding. So in thinking about kind of other agronomic considerations, uh, really to, you know, end up with a, a well-established cover crop at the end of the growing season uh, when you're drilling or seeding. The cover crop has to go through several periods of, of you know, potential kind of stressors uh, in the corn stage or uh, in the corn phase. Um, and so the first one is really, if you're using residual herbicides, there's this potential for uh, the residual herbicides to persist um, and be at levels in the soil that would cause injury when you're interseeding at that you know v3 to v5 stage so 35 or 42 days after planting um, and so there's a, a real need to kind of reconsider your herbicide program approach um, but then there's also this period um, during establishment where the goal is uh, to intercede early enough uh, to allow that cover crop to establish and put put down some roots prior to canopy closure uh, and then that cover crop needs to persist through that period of canopy closure until we see some leaf drop. And um, typically that's when we start to see some resumption in, in, in growth or, or really see the cover crop take off. Um, and so the way we think about this is from a, a weed management standpoint, we certainly advocate starting clean um, with a post-emergence pass, a glyphosate um, a pass. And so, um, some some growers are able to get away with just a burn down application in a no-till system or if it's a, a a tilled system and just rely on a one pass herbicide program using that post glyphosate to, to start clean um, now we have a fair amount of glyphosate resistant weed species in pennsylvania uh, and there's some some holes when you're just relying on glyphosate in general and so we uh, really advocate for using some type of setup residual program to start clean um, and and um, then come in with a second pass of glyphosate prior to interseeding. And I'll talk more here about the residual programs. Uh, but in general, too, I just wanted to note what we have found in playing with kind of the interseeding timing is if you intercede too early uh, and you have no weed control uh, after you intercede, um, you know, you're potentially uh, creating a situation in which you have uh, some, some weed recruitment still going on. And so now we have weeds emerging with the interseeded cover crop. Uh, you may end up weedier than normal um, and you might be losing some cover crop performance potential due to weed competition. If you intercede too late uh, and you don't have enough time prior to corn canopy closure, um, so that's um, often when we really see cover crops struggle to persist through the growing season. Um, and so there is a, a probably a very narrow kind of management window we think to be successful and, and weed management is a big part of that, that consideration. So um, as far as herbicide carryover injury to cover crops, now here we can broaden this and, and even if you're not interseeding and you're um, trying to integrate cover crops after corn silage, these same factors would apply, right? As far as what are the kind of the moving parts that create conditions where we might see some carryover injury from residual herbicides. And so, you know, the first consideration is is kind of this interaction between weather, soil, and time. So there's a couple conditions that increase the likelihood of, of uh, residual carryover injury in general across uh, herbicide active ingredients. And so 
when we start out um, with good precipitation and it's nice and warm after we've applied those herbicides at planting, uh, we have good microbial activity and herbicides are degrading in the soil as we would expect. Um, if we apply those um, herbicides and we enter a drought period uh, or a long sustained period without rain, um, or if it's cooler, um, uh, it ends up being a cooler earlier um, season, those are conditions that increase the likelihood of, of those herbicides persisting and potentially creating some carryover injury. Um, as far as soil factors, high organic matter soils, uh, soils with higher clay uh, content um, end up um, with greater herbicide persistence in general. And so uh, that can be an interacting factor that contributes to that. And then also just the amount of time, right? So if we're applying herbicides in that post pass that have some residual activity, um, and then we enter that, you know, summer growing season where we might have less rain, um, you know, that, that might also create conditions where we have potential for carryover injury. The second is herbicide properties. Um, and so here's just a list of some of the typical sites of action that we use in corn programs as a, you know, from our pre-plant um, or early post uh, type approach. Um, and so they're going to differ in kind of the weed control spectrum, and therefore uh, they'll also kind of have some differences in the greatest risk to cover crops, right? So our group 15 herbicides, so things like metolachlor, peroxisulfone, acetochlor, as well as our group three herbicides. So those are dinitroanilins, penimethylin would be the one in corn. There's other group threes and vegetables that might be uh, being used. So those pose the greatest risk to um, grass cover crops uh, and some small seeded um, broadleaf cover crops as well. Uh, and then we also, well, we have the products that are really carrying the load as far as providing that broadleaf weed control uh, early in the growing season. And those are gonna be the same products that would pose greater risks to um, our legume or brassica cover crops. Um, but they also, these, these products are going to differ in, um, you know, their, their persistence in the, in the soil and then also, you know, at what dose that they're phytotoxic, right? So some are going to be more active at lower doses um, and in, in the soil. And so we know kind of some general things about um, the behavior of these herbicides. What we know less about is how um, cover crop traits really determine um, how sensitive, the, the sensitivity to any one given herbicide. Um, and so uh, we've started kind of working on this um, to try to perhaps identify some relative differences between cover crop species as far as their sensitivity to these types of herbicides. And so the way we've gone about that is to think about one, their taxonomic group. So uh, brassicas, legumes, grasses, uh, polygonums. Um, and then also their seed size, because we know residual herbicides from a weed control um, spectrum, um, we see larger seeded weeds breaking uh, quicker uh, than smaller seeded. And so we would expect to see the same type of trend uh, with our cover crops. Uh, so right now, based on um, several years of, of field trials in Pennsylvania, um, where we've screened different types of products. Most of this work was uh, single active ingredients. Some of it was with uh, herbicide mixtures. Uh, our current recommendations, if you are interceding at the V4 growth stage, uh, and, and this is really focused on um, kind of the workhorse species, annual ryegrass and red, red clover, um, we're pretty much down to um, dimethenamine as a product that provides good foundational annual grass control. Uh, the other group 15s like um, esmetolachlor or peroxisulfone um, persist um, too long in the soil to, to allow us to safely intercede annual ryegrass. Uh, but dimethenamine is one that would provide a, a couple weeks of, of weed suppression but typically degrade in time to, to allow us to establish those cover crop species. Uh, we also um, have trouble uh, integrating HPPD herbicides um, and, and still be able to interseed. And so we, in order to interseed, you really need to be able to pull those 
active ingredients out of your um, setup program. And so that would be mesotrione or isoxaflutol type products. Um, and so we're down to just several very short lived um, residual activity products that we would have to provide some, some weed control up front. Uh, we think that we can get away with atrazine at lower rates. So if you're at a pound of atrazine or lower, um, cefalofenacil is one that has just a, a little bit of residual activity, but provides some good burn down activity um, that, that, that can be used um, in corn programs. And then a couple of our ALS inhibitors or group two or herbicides are short enough lived uh, that we can use them to provide a little bit of broadleaf control, uh, it, but they still degrade in time to intercede. And so that would be room sulfuron or, or thyphon sulfuron uh, products. Okay, so um, we've also now, you know, the, the more recent work is kind of taking what we've learned uh, in the field and thinking about how do we expand kind of the, the number of species that we might be able to use in interceding systems and can we take advantage of some differences in cover crop traits to do that, right? So you can see here on the right, this graph of cover crops ranked by seed mass our best performing interseeding species happen to be our smallest seeded species. And so there might be something to that from a kind of a shade tolerance plant trait um, uh, response, uh, but there's enough interest and enough folks that are trying to interseed these other uh, types of species that we thought it would be helpful to kind of understand of whether uh, using a different mixture or larger seeded species uh, would allow us to use uh, longer lived residual herbicides. And so we've been doing um, a series of um, greenhouse screenings to get at this question. Um, and so we start out, uh, we've uh, used these 12 species that give us a nice uh, suite of, of the taxonomic groups and then some differences uh, in seed mass or seed size. Uh, and we've done dose response screenings in the greenhouse. Um, and so what we're doing, you can see down here as an example, uh, we would apply um, uh, six different herbicide rates based on a standard label rate of a herbicide. Uh, and it would be simulating basically a half-life. So we're just you know cutting that rate in half each time. Uh, and then we would model um, that dose response curve to come up with a, you know, a comparable test to st statistic that we could use across herbicide groups to compare the relative sensitivity of a cover crop species uh, within a herbicide active ingredient. So you can see an example here of sc the screening we did for acetochlor, uh, which is a group 15 herbicide. And this is um, on the x-axis is the effective dose or ED50 value, which is basically uh, at what rate um, on, a, on a scale using the 1x rate do we see a 50% reduction in biomass in the greenhouse? And so that allows us to tell, you know, to see uh, how these rank as far as relative sensitivity. So you can see uh, for acetochlor, the brassica cover crops, for example, um, you know, at a simulated half-life or two half-lives, we, we see a 50% reduction whereas something like a small seeded legume, the clovers um, at a simulated four or five half lives, we're still seeing a 50% a, a reduction. So we think that that's a starting place then to take this to the field and try to understand whether um, you know, cover crops that are relatively less sensitive to a given herbicide allow us uh, to use that herbicide and still get away with, with interseeding. Um, and so here is an example of, of what we're trying to do as far as a decision support tool. Uh, you can see on the right, the first group of herbicides that we looked at were the group 15s. Um, I, uh, we, I have a graduate student, Tosh Mazzoni, who's um, using a similar approach with HPPD uh, herbicides and atrazine. So we're hoping we can come up with a similar kind of decision tool uh, as you see here on the right. Um, but just as an example, um, what we found is that um, certainly, you know, winter cereals are significantly less sensitive to these group 15 herbicides compared to annual ryegrass. Uh, we do see 
um, kind of a, a seed size difference between sensitivity of legume species, but we also see a fair amount of variability uh, with those smaller seeded legumes. Um, with the brassicas, um, we don't really have as large of a seed size gradient between something like winter canola to forage radish. Uh, so we weren't really seeing a seed size difference, but we were seeing is that pretty similar patterns within, um, uh, within a herbicide group. And we saw some significant differences where we think we might have some safety with things like dimethenamide or maybe even metolachlor, whereas something like peroxisulfone seems to be, um, brassicas seem to be highly sensitive to. So, uh, you know, as far as proof of concept in, the, in, in field trials, um, and, and so my grad student Tosh has been kind of taking this, uh, these ideas and putting them into practice using uh, a field trial approach. Um, and, and I would say that um, we've only maybe slightly modified our recommendations based on this work. We still think that you need short duration residuals uh, to be able to intercede these small seeded cover crop species like annual ryegrass and, and medium red clover uh, and canola species. Um, but if you can make some larger seeded cover crops like Austrian winter pea or maybe winter cereals work uh, and, and, and they can persist uh, in your interseeded system, we do think that there's the potential for kind of increasing the length of residuals uh, that you might be able to use up front. And so moving to something like acetochlor or metolachlor uh, and an astrazine based program is probably going to provide better weed control um, uh, relative to those short, short lived residuals. Okay, so I'm going to transition now and talk about um, seeding covers um, after or into uh, small grains. And so um, you know, most of our work it has focused on, um, you know, thinking about uh, the cover cropping window after winter wheat. So we don't have a lot of um, winter grains in Pennsylvania, but um, we're seeing more adoption of that as we're seeing pretty good yields. Um, but that allows us, um, at least in areas where we're not trying to double crop soybeans, to uh, do some more things when it comes to cover crops. So. Um, that's really the window that would allow us to really integrate some high diversity mixtures um, and, and maybe target uh, multiple different kind of ecosystem services. Um, and in a no-till system, um, and perhaps in your area, if you're in a no, you, you wouldn't uh, do tillage after small grains and just try to seed right into uh, wheat stubble. Um, certainly, if glyphosate is, is um, effective enough to start clean, that's your tool for doing so. Uh, but in Pennsylvania, what we're founding is, you know, with the presence of, of a, a few glyphosate resistant weeds, as well as some other um, hard to control weeds with glyphosate that we need other options to be able to start clean after small grains. And so we did um, some field trials to look at uh, other non-glyphosate options um, for starting clean after that small grain phase and, and um, uh, drilling uh, uh, cover crops. Um, and so how we did that was, um, you know, we're in the early September window um, in order to really kind of produce the worst case scenario or a scenario where we would potentially see some injury of those residual herbicides or, or the burn down herbicides. Uh, we did some tillage, uh, we applied the burn down treatments, and then we irrigated in order to make sure that they were activated in the soil. And then we seeded the same cover crop species um, directly after that, and then seven days and 14 days after to, to try to understand whether you kind of need to wait uh, and allow those burn down herbicides to dissipate before you can safely uh, come back and, and seed cover crops. Uh, and so we were looking at, um, as far as non-glyphosate uh, burn down options, saflufenacil. Um, so for us, that's Sharpen, um, Glufosinate, or Liberty. Um, and then the two auxins, 2,4-D or Dicamba, we also had Haloxifen or, or Elevore as well uh, in there. And so I'm not going to walk through uh, the, you know, all the the details in this figure to your right, but we had a number of um, different species. We included uh, annual ryegrass, cereal, cereal rye, forage radish, and, and several legumes. Um, 
And so the general takeaways from that work were that we found really good safety uh, and really kind of limited risk to um, seeing, seeing cover crop injury um, when using cephalofenacil or glufosinate. Uh, so that's, that's really good news. Those are effective um, products for some of our glyphosate resistant weed species. Um, and then as far as the oxen herbicides, 2,4-D and dicamba, uh, we, de we did see some um, potential injury to grasses uh, if we were trying to come back immediately or even seven days after application. And so we think that there's some caution that needs to be applied uh, and perhaps a waiting period if you're needing to use those herbicides uh, in your burn down program. We saw a difference between 2,4-D and dicamba when it came to the sensitivity of forage radish, and that's not surprising. We know that 2,4-D is a better uh, product for controlling mustards, and so we saw a greater risk uh, to injury of forage radish in our 2,4-D applications compared to dicamba. And then both of those products, uh, a fair amount of injury to those legumes. And so certainly if you're trying to integrate legumes and you need a non-glyphosate tool, uh, moving to something like um, cephalofenacil or glufosinate, uh, perhaps in a mixture with glyphosate, uh, you're going to be in a better spot than relying on those uh, oxen herbicides. Okay, I'm, uh, uh, there's, there's some growers uh, in Pennsylvania that are frost seeding uh, clover into winter wheat. Uh, we do that in our organic grain crops. It's a pretty um, uh, you know, typical practice that works well. Um, but in a conventional system, the, the, the question then would be, are there some risks or how do I, how, how do I fit some weed control in that winter, winter wheat phase and still allow uh, us to, to underseed or frost seed uh, medium red clover into the grain? And, and we haven't looked at this, but I'm borrowing a slide from a colleague at Michigan State, Christy Sprague, who has done some field trials asking that, that very question. Uh, and so uh, what Christy found in her work is that um, if you're applying um, some of these uh, typical products that we might use uh, as a post-emergence tool in the fall after wheat has established, after the two leaf stage, um, a, a few typical products like Harmony Extra or for 2,4-D, uh, she saw a really low potential for, for injury when you were coming back uh, in the winter in frost seeding medium red clover. And so the only ones that she really identified uh, that had some real potential to cause injury uh, were Osprey and PowerFlex, so mesosulfuron and, and peroxalam, which are both ALS inhibitors. And we would be using those products uh, in our rotations to control um, the annual grasses that are problematic in winter wheat. So Italian ryegrass, um, annual bluegrass, or, or now rough stock bluegrass is a, is a, is a tough weed uh, in our systems. And so if you don't have those grass weeds, you wouldn't be uh, necessarily probably using those products. Uh, and then lastly, this Culex or Haloxifen, which is a new group four, newer group four herbicide, um, and is typically not being used, um, it has a, kind of a, a, a fit in that spring green up window, uh, but is not used uh, too much in our systems. Okay, uh, I, I thought too, I might just include um, a couple lessons that were learned from um, a long-term cropping systems project um, that has gone on here at, at Penn State called the Cover Crop Cocktails uh, Project. Um, it follows an organic grain rotation uh, and it really focuses on um, how do we use mixtures, cover crop mixtures after a small grain phase or after a corn silage phase in order to um, um, get multiple ecosystem services. And so they're thinking about either fixing nitrogen for that next crop or scavenging nitrogen um, uh, and, and the benefits of biodiversity. And another thing that they, that project has measured is the weed suppression potential of those mixtures. Um, and so there was a really nice paper that summarized that um, work uh, that I thought was worth highlighting. And so what they found was, um, well, 
back up. They 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 um, have this suite of of cover crop species that they test um, in that after the small grain phase, and it includes monocultures of brassicas, legumes, uh, or grasses, and then different types of mixtures that are targeting different types of ecosystem services. Uh, but what that allows them to do is then compare a monoculture performance compared to a mixture performance. And so what you see in the right bottom right hand corner is the weed suppression potential from legume monocultures, and they're using red clover or Austrian winter pea, grassica monocultures, and grass monocultures. And so the takeaway is, is that, um, you know, aggressive and quickly establishing grass species are critical for optimizing weed suppression. Uh, but that um, if, as long as you have grasses as a component in your cover crop mixture and their number is that if it's a 20%, if the proportion of the mixture is 20% of the monoculture rate, um, that is sufficient to really um, maintain that weed suppression potential. So their takeaway was that you can still get high levels of weed suppression with mixtures. It's critical to make sure you have a really strong, good, good grass component in that mixture to optimize that service. Okay, and so another, um, I just wanna provide a, a, a little bit of background um, on that window and, and kind of the role of cover crops as an integrated weed management tool. And so, um, our number one no-till weed in Pennsylvania is uh, glyphosate-resistant horseweed, Canisa canadensis, Canada fleabane in your world. I believe um, it might be uh, perhaps not as pernicious of a weed problem, but a weed problem nonetheless. Um, and so this is really, a, you know, I call it an unmanageable weed problem made manageable with fall sown cover crops. And so uh, we see this certainly um, after corn silage, um, it can be a problem after, after small grains. Uh, and it's a really difficult weed to control in no-till soybean production systems. And what we try to avoid is uh, a situation like this in which a grower uh, doesn't manage mare's tail or, or, or horseweed. Um, until they're ready to plant, no-till plant in the spring. And, and if planting gets delayed and those burn downs get delayed, then they're dealing with plants that are much too large to really control with burned down herbicides. And so the role of cover crops is to provide some of that uh, competition in, in the fall and, and spring growing season when we see horseweed emerging. Um, and so we looked at different windows. Um, and so this is this would be um, kind of considerations for seeding cover crops after corn silage. Uh, we're focusing on horseweed as 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 the weed um, uh, management problem, but this would apply to other winter annual weeds as well. And so much like the cover crop cocktails work, we found that, um, you know, a, a good grass cover crop like cereal rye, a winter hardy cover crop, or even oats in some cases can provide really high levels of horseweed suppression. Um, but the weed suppression potential in those systems is really driven by fertility and, and species selection. And so uh, it's those aggressive species and in high fertility systems, uh, we see even greater and quicker um, ground cover establishment. And so, um, so for a cereal rye monoculture or a rye in a mixture with forage radish, um, we saw weed suppression potential greater than 75% uh, for, for horseweed. And that's measuring the reduction in the emerged horseweed population at the time where we would be applying a spring burn down application. The other thing that we did was we actually measured the size of weeds within those infestations. And so the reason why that's important is it's those larger individuals within that population. It's typically the ones that emerge in the fall that create large rosettes or bolt prior to applying those burned down herbicides. Uh, and we start to really struggle um, as far as being effective with things like 2,4-D or dicamba or even Sharpen or safflofenacil uh, when, when mer horseweed plants get large. And so because we have that cover crop out there providing that weed competition, perhaps eliminating um, some of that fall recruitment, we end up 
constraining the size of that the the individual size uh, of, of horseweed plants and so we get rid of a lot of those large uh individuals that are going to be the ones that potentially would survive a burn down application and so that's another benefit uh we also think that translates to maybe buying growers a week or two or maybe more to be able to come in with a timely uh, pre-plant burn down herbicide. And so it's some management flexibility that you gain with having that cover crop uh, out there as well. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and then lastly, um, you know, one, one of the issues is certainly for when you're taking crops off later, um, you, you probably have a really narrow window to do multiple field operations. And so, while we always would advocate that if you're gonna invest in a, in a cover crop, you should start clean. And so that might mean coming in with a, a burn down application. And, and so after you're harvesting corn, you may not have time to both seed a cover crop and get a burn down out there. And so um, if you are just using a winter sown um, or a winter cereal like cereal rye, you could prioritize getting that cover crop established, wait for that cover crop to come up and then you perhaps have another, a few other opportunities to selectively control weeds uh, if necessary using oxen herbicides. And so our work uh, demonstrated that potential that we could sow, cover, we could sow winter uh, rye uh, after we took those grain crops off and still come in at, in early spring and selectively control uh, uh, horseweed um, with 2,4-D or, or dicamba. Um, okay, so the last section I want to cover is just some considerations for terminating cover crops in the spring. Uh, there's a lot of interest in our state, um, a lot of no-till producers that are realizing the benefits of delaying termination, um, uh, and, and most often it's winter cereals, but it would also include some, some mixtures um, uh, that would include legumes or brassicas. Uh, and so um, one of the things they realize is, is the gains that they get from weed suppression potential by creating that surface mulch. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of work thinking about uh, the role of, of cover crop surface mulches in an integrated weed management program, both from managing winter annual weeds, but then also providing early season weed suppression of emerging uh, summer annual weeds. Um, but there's you know, a real need to kind of negotiate the trade-offs because there's potential drawbacks when it comes to cash crop establishment. One of them in our area is kind of soil moisture management. So growers that are doing that are killing the cover crop if it's uh, getting dry and, and the cover crop is taking up too much water. So they're thinking about making sure that they have the right soil moisture conditions and that the field is fit uh, when they wanna plant into that cover crop. And so we've been thinking about um, making sure that we're using good burn down applications in order to kill that cover crop when we, when, when we, when we need it to be killed, whether that's prior to establishing uh, the cash crop or for uh, growers that are interested in delaying termination and using planting green practices. So um, we've had some trials out that have looked at um, different kind of burn down programs um, and we focused on just zero rye monocultures, kind of thinking about uh, using that ahead of a, of a corn crop. Um, and so we looked at uh, either glyphosate-based programs with or without atrazine or uh, paraquat-based uh, program with or without atrazine. And we were um, applying these burn down treatments at different growth stages. And so we, what you're looking at on the right is the growth stage where we're targeting it about the boot stage. And then we also allow that cover crop to go longer into the late heading stage where we either just sprayed um, into the standing cover crop or we uh, roll crimped and planted and then came in and applied those same herbicides. And you can see um, some of the kind of herbicide interactions that we observed. Um, so these are really low rates of glyphosate. And, and part of the reason why we did that was because of the shortages last season. We had some questions from growers as far as how low of a glyphosate rate can I can I can I use and still effectively kill cover crops? And so that was also kind of a motivation of of the rate structure in these trials. Uh, but the key takeaway here is that um, you can certainly see kind of a rate break with glyphosate, um, but 
notice what's going on with the panel on the bottom where we're um, applying atrazine in the tank with glyphosate, right? So we're at seven days after treatment, it's taking a lot longer for that cover crop to grow down. Um, and that's not, that's what we would expect. We know that there's the potential for atrazine to antagonize the efficacy of glyphosate. And we thought it was important to show that to growers because they're interested in conserving soil moisture. And so they want that cover crop to die quickly. Um, and you can see that in comparison, the, the Paraquat and the Paraquat plus atrazine, we had a lot more, uh, a quicker burn down. Uh, but as we followed that, um, the story kind of changed. Um, we still saw the rate break, um, but really the glyphosate at the, the three quarters of a pound rate with or without atrazine um, eventually died. And when we evaluated it 28 days after treatment, uh, the glyphosate program ended up with better uh, control of serial rye relative to the paraquat treatment. So we saw greater burn down activity with the paraquat early but really greater uh, control levels with glyphosate-based programs. Um, and so the story with the application timing, um, and you can see the conditions here in this picture where we were applying uh, these herbicides into a pretty large standing cover crop uh, or after we've rolled that cover crop uh, into the rolled crimp cover crop. Um, and so the general takeaways from this work were, you know, as far as thinking about including residual products um, you know, at the time that you're killing the cover crop. Uh, often that's gonna have atrazine in the tank and for glyphosate-based programs, that's a potential antagonist. Um, you may still kill that cover crop, but it might uh, take longer for it to go down. With Paraquat, it becomes a synergist. We see greater activity. Um, in those later termination timings um, at Anthesis, uh, the addition of atrazine is really needed to be effective with Paraquat. Paraquat alone uh, really wasn't effective. We saw good activity with the glyphosate-based programs. We thought we might see some differences in roll crimping versus standing uh, applications. We, saw, we did see some small differences and really the takeaway there was that, um, and, and what previous work has also shown is that we can be equally effective with the glyphosate-based program, whether we're applying it before or after crimping. Uh, but with Paraquat, we saw better activity uh, after roll crimping. Um, and then finally, just to wrap up, uh, I was going to stick this in the interseeding um, uh, section, but I, I thought it perhaps went better here. So, you know, where we do have uh, successful interseeding, it's uh, in, in our state, it's, it's typically folks that are are making annual ryegrass work, which is a, a great cover crop. It provides a lot of the, the services that we want from soil erosion protection and, and um, nitrogen scavenging, but we know it's harder to kill in a no-till system. So if you're if you're plowing in the spring, that's, that's one thing. Uh, if you're trying to kill annual ryegrass in the spring in a no-till system prior to planting a cash crop, uh, it, it requires a higher level of management to be effective consistently. Um, and so we talk about four things when it comes to controlling annual ryegrass in the spring. Uh, certainly higher rates of glyphosate as your foundation are important. Um, weather conditions matter. And so we like to see warmer temperatures in the spring uh, when we're making those applications above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, to actively growing annual ryegrass before it gets large. And, and so that might be a tough window um, for folks that might have a, a later or, uh, spring and, and you might not be able to get in uh, when it's warm to make those applications. Uh, but what can help is some additional tank mix partners. And so what our work found that including one more site of action in that burn down program that provides some good post-emergence grass activity uh, can make annual ryegrass um, burn down more, more consistently effective. And so the two products that we found was tank mixing glyphosate uh, with a rim sulfuron product, when, and the fit there would be a head of corn, um, or with soybeans using a group one product like clethodim. Uh, it, it really achieved higher levels of control compared to glyphosate alone. Um, so just to wrap up, um, 
covered kind of three different scenarios, uh, just a couple takeaways. So when thinking about interceding corn, uh, short duration residuals, um, you know, we, th we think are important because it helps protect the crop yields, uh, but you really need to be careful in your selection of those, those products. Uh, if you can achieve your cover cropping goals with fewer cover crop species, that perhaps allows us uh, to identify a better residual program to be able to control those weeds. So that's another thing to consider. I know a lot of folks are interested in using interseeding to establish mixtures, uh, but I would advocate that it should be goal oriented. Um, and then lastly, our, our latest work suggests that if you can make large seeded cover crops work in your system, that may also help facilitate um, the use of some different herbicide programs that might provide longer um, residual activity. Um, and then, so for cover crop mixtures after wheat, starting clean uh, is important. Um, and, and if you need a non-glyphosate based burn down program, um, there's a few products that, that there would be concern for some carryover injury potential. So thinking about waiting seven to 14 days, depending on that product. Um, as far as maximizing weed suppression in that longer growing season window, particularly when you're trying to uh, integrate cover crop mixtures, make sure that you have a grass comp component in there uh, to really optimize weed suppression potential. Um, and then for terminating cover crops, um, there's several, you know, kind of potential tank mix antagonism issues uh, that that might create some early season problems as far as effectively killing that cover crop on time. And so make sure you're aware of those uh, those issues. A big part of that is just um, kind of best management practices when it comes to application timing and selection of nozzle types and that kind of thing. Um, so, so also make sure you're consulting the labels. And then finally, I didn't really have time uh, today to, to dive into this, but we're really seeing um, here in Pennsylvania the benefits of delaying cover crop termination and allowing that cover crop to get bigger uh, and creating a, weed, a more weed suppressive mulch. And so we think that's a really um, viable integrated weed management tactic uh, in our no-till systems for some of our driver weed species. Um, so that's all I have. It looks like I saved a, a few minutes, uh, Caitlin, for questions. So um, thanks, thanks for the time. I, um, and I'd be happy to answer any of the questions. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. That was a, a ton of really great information. So we do have a few questions um, and comments. So I'll actually address the first one. It says for post glyphosate application in corn, do we have any Roundup resistant weeds in Nova Scotia? Um, so we do have willow herb, which I believe is naturally kind of glyphosate resistant. Um, but other than that, as far as I know, we don't um, have any officially uh, resistant glyphosate resistant weeds. However, there are so many of them out there. Um, and there's a lot in Ontario and even multiple, um, multiple group resistant uh, weeds. So that's definitely something we want to pay attention to and uh, keep an eye on in your own crop. Yeah. So then we have a comment um, from Andrew McKenzie Gopsler, who is a weed scientist over at AFC Harrington and PEI. Uh, who says we've no-tilled in winter wheat following a spring application of sulfentrazone uh, to faba beans and not seen any injury to wheat over four site years. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, um, I, yeah, I, I, that's, that's, that's what we would expect in kind of a soybean to winter wheat phase, uh, Andrew. So, um, you know, there's been a fair amount of work across kind of the, the Corn Belt and in and, and our region looking at, um, uh, you know, pre-soybean pre, uh, herbicides and the potential for, for carryover injury to, to fall sown covers, or in this case, a, a, a winter grain. Um, sulfentrazone is one that we would expect to, to typically break as, uh, in most years um, and pretty limited, you know, risk to winter cereal cover crops. Um, the only PPO inhibitor that um, there seems to be a red flag for is uh, mesophen, and that in, in soybeans, I'm not sure in faba beans, but uh, or if that's even labeled uh, in that crop, but um, 
we would be applying that perhaps post emergence, which narrows that you know uh, that window for coming back and planting a cover crop as well, and it's and it's longer lived. So there's as far as the PPOs, that's the one that we um, would be concerned about following soybeans. It would be femesophen. Excellent. Um, there was a, a question that Rosie actually uh, provided some information on, but I, I'll read that out anyways and get your thoughts on it if you have any. Um, the question is, I know that there are some potato producers worried about herbicide carryover from sulfentrazone, and do you see that as a concern? Um, we did a, a really cool um, kind of demonstration um, that Rosie shared some information on there. And in that demo, we saw a reduction in buckwheat growth when it was planted three weeks after authority, which would be sulfentrazone, um, but only if the ground was tilled between herbicide application and cover crop planting. And that was the only long-term effect for authority on the um, 16 cover crops that were tried in that demo. Is, is buckwheat. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. You know, buckwheat is one that, um, you know, there's a fair amount of interest. Um, I'm not sure it's the best fit for interseeding, but um, certainly kind of there's enough time um, if you can get in early fall to to, to sow buckwheat. Um, and, and that's one where um, we don't have a whole lot of information as far as residual carryover uh, mm -hmm. kind of questions. And so we started including that in the screens, you know, it's kind of stands out different. It's a different family compared, you know, it's a polygonum. And, and so that's, that's good information. If, if mm -hmm. you guys are, are coming up with some, some kind of relative risks um, for, for that situation. Yeah, absolutely. And I see that Rosie shared the, uh, the link to that blog post um, about that demo trial in the chat. So I definitely encourage people to check that out. Um, it's yeah, it was some of the um, herbicides that we used in it were kind of more targeted at horticulture production, um, but lots of really, really good information there. All right, we do have a, a few more questions here. Um, so you said you had seen benefits of delaying cover crop burn down. Is this only for weed suppression or are there other benefits as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, there's a there's a there's there's been a national survey um, that that's been published um, as far as kind of cover cropping practices in the states. Uh, it's put out by SARE, the Sustainable Ag Research and Education, um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, based on grower feedback. So, I'll give the grower feedback. Uh, kind of um, perspective, and then I'll talk a little bit about my perspective. And so um, for growers that have, have used this practice um, and have adopted this practice of what we call planting green, which is delaying cover crop termination until at or after planting, uh, the, the two biggest benefits they see is they see it as a water management tool. Uh, so they, 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 they kill that cover crop adaptively. Uh, so they're thinking about using that cover crop to um, plant when the field is fit to plant in no-till systems. And so in our region, we expect uh, wetter early springs. Uh, and so that can delay getting into the field to, to, to hit those targeted uh, planting dates. And so um, in those types of springs, allowing that cover crop to grow. And, and so now we're pulling soil moisture out. Um, uh, can 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 uh, kind of provide that management flexibility and, and hit those dates. So they see it as this adaptive management tool. Uh, and then they also recognize that, yeah, you know, biomass, there's a strong link between biomass that you produce and the amount of weed suppression that you see. Um, so those are the two biggest ones that growers point out. And I do think that, um, We've done enough on station research and some on farm research that have shown that uh, it's certainly a, a good tool for drawing down soil moisture conditions in wet springs, but you can't predict the weather. So if you if you turn dry, uh, we have seen yield drags from delaying termination, both in soybeans and more in corn. And part of that story is perhaps um, the soil moisture dynamics that play out because it's not just that 
the, the top inch or two of the soil profile that you're influencing, if you have a well-established cover crop, it's pulling soil moisture out from, from deeper depths. Mm. Uh, and that, that may, um, you may never just see the, the, the recharge uh, throughout the growing season. Um, so that's really where a lot of our work is focused now and, and how I think about that as an integrated weed management tool is it has to de need to be an adaptive weed management tool because there's these other considerations for when we want to kill that cover crop. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. Um, how are fertility recommendations modified when cover cropping grasses with corn? I think we could do a whole webinar on that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like, um, I, I'm not the expert uh, on this. Um, well, we have some really, you know, our, our soil fertility specialist here is, is doing really great work in thinking about how to properly credit or, or debit, um, uh, you know, your, your, your nitrogen um, rates based on, on, on the cover crop um, and, and elsewhere in the country as well. But so the growers that are, that are delaying cover crop termination um, ahead of corn, um, are typically maybe compensating for some early season, you know, uh, nitrogen immobilization by putting more up front and then coming back and, and side dressing the balance. Um, and so that's, um, that's typically how it's being, um, you know, uh, how, how fertility is being adjusted is with split applications, uh, making sure that you have nitrogen up front uh, when you know that you'll, you'll be limit, more limited. Um, but I also think that um, some of the work that's coming out suggests that we're not actually getting a whole lot of that nitrogen that was fixed by the cover crop back in that growing season, at least not in time uh, for it to supply nitrogen when when corn demands. And so um, there there may uh, there, there's certainly the potential for this legacy effect of adopting higher residue cover crops in your system and the benefits for building up soil organic matter and, and that contributing to, uh, you know, some, some nitrogen availability as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, long-term effects. <laughs> um, great. It is one o'clock, but we just have a couple more questions if you have a, a couple more minutes here, and then we can kind of wrap those up. Okay. Um, what's the best way to control wild carrot? Um, that's been seen coming up in no-till systems and tillage systems, even after a cover crop or winter wheat has been planted? Uh, even after a cover crop or winter wheat has been planted. Oh, well, um, man, I, I'd have to look up in our guide. That's not one that we, t you know, that's typically a field edge issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and the carrot family, I think your oxen herbicides and maybe some group two ALS inhibitors would be the uh, would be the the, the go tos that I would I would start. But I would have to to look that up to see uh, how they break out as far as um, effic efficacy goes. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, and the last question: Is there much point in interseeding cover crops into grain corn due to the delayed harvest? So, for context, our grain corn. Um, could be harvested anywhere from early October to early November. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that that's really where we that, you know, our grain, cro grain crop acres are, are where we see the growth, you know, I think the growth potential for interseeding is in our state and that it's because, um, you know, there's a lot of growers that allow that corn to dry in the field and they're out there at Thanksgiving or in November or December still harvesting yeah. corn. Um, and so you you've basically you know, at that point, go from a limited growing season window to no growing season window for establishing a, a fall cover crop. And so if that's the case, um, then, you know, when you intercede the cover crop, the idea is, is that you really, um, you're unlikely to see much growth in biomass production throughout the corn uh, growing season until you start to see leaf drop and the canopy opens up. And so at that point, you're at maturity, the canopy's opened up, you have leaf drop, and it may still be two months before you harvest that corn, but that's two months of a growing season for an established cover crop. And so that's really the fit. Um, it's variable enough in its performance that I, I my recommendation would be that, um, at least in our area, and because we're, we, we would harvest corn silage a little earlier than than you would, that you're going to end up 
probably being more successful post-harvest seeding after corn silage in Pennsylvania. Uh, just the uniformity of the stand will probably be better. Um, and you should be able to have time to establish that cover crop so that you're getting the soil erosion protection, you're getting the, the nitrogen scavenging potential. I'm not saying that there's not a fit in corn silage systems in our region, but you have to kind of measure the return on investment in that case, as far as post-harvest seeding versus interseeding. Whereas in some grain crop production acres in our state, there's there's no comparison to be made because they just can't fit a cover crop behind it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and most years, I would say we wouldn't be able to get something in behind corn silage. Um, but this, this year was definitely an exception to that. We had um, a really long, mild fall. And, and so people who harvested corn silage you know, into early October might have still been able to get something in. But typically as a rule, um, yeah, I think interseeding is an interesting option for that. Exactly, yeah. Excellent. Um, but yes, thank you so much, John. That was a lot of really excellent information. And I know I'm gonna have to go back and, and watch the presentation recording and uh, and try to, absorb it all again. Um, but yeah, no, excellent, excellent information. And thank you so much for, for doing this with us. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone.